in this series called Summer Reading, and what we're doing is just, um, because people are in and out, going on vacation, lots of things going on in our community, want to make it easy for you guys to plug into what we're doing. And so we're working our way through the book of Colossians, and we've got this week and next week, and then we're going to shift to 1 John. And I tell you that because all you got to do is just commit to read a chapter a week, and then we'll be on the same page with what we're doing. Today we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, and um, this is a good chapter because whether you're new to the faith or you've been trying to follow Jesus for decades, this chapter has got something to say to each of us. And um, I'm going to go ahead and give you the punchline right off the bat. Um, Paul's talking about work, and he's talking about marriage, and he's talking about parenting. And to get us prepared to kind of navigate all of those relationships, Paul gives us some pretty practical and I think very direct instruction and encouragement. And uh, if there's one big idea, it would simply be this. They've kind of already got it in the song there, um, is that you have what it takes. You really do. And I know sometimes that's hard for us to grasp, especially when you look at what's going on in our world right now, but that is the core message, that you have what it takes. Um, that's what I've been telling my kids their whole life, and that idea got tested for our family um, last year. Some of you guys know that our youngest son is in college, and um, he's about to go into his senior year, thank God, and then we'll be free from all of that, so we're pumped about that. Um, but um, two of my three sons played college football, and so this one is also playing college uh, football, and he started college his freshman year. It was great. Got to play in every game um, and was starting his career off great, and then um, COVID hit, and like a lot of you guys that have children that went to college or, to, or were in school, they sent everybody home. And so we had to navigate a college freshman in his second semester online only. Then they went back in the fall and their season was canceled because of COVID. And so they actually played an abbreviated schedule in the spring, which was weird because it's not spring, it's actually the dead of winter. Um, and they travel all over the country. And so that was interesting to try to navigate that. Then he made it to summer, and we got him home, and um, he was playing basketball with some of his friends about uh, a month before summer camp started, and he broke his leg. And uh, it was a horrific break. He wound up um, nine pins, got a plate, um, really had to kind of piece his leg back together, and I really thought that that was probably it. Our biggest concern was, is this kid going to be able to walk again? Um, but he kind of leaned in. Uh, rehab like crazy, got back on the field before the season ended, which we could not believe, and he's completely healed. But that whole time that we were navigating that process, I kept trying to tell Luke, look, you've got what it takes. You, you've been created on purpose, for a purpose, with purpose. And if you work hard enough, you've got what it takes to make it through this nightmare that has been your college experience. And sure enough, he did that. I mean, it's just that basic idea. You've got what it takes. It's what I tell myself. When I look at my job or when I look at how I parent my kids or how I interact with my wife, I'm always like, you know, some days I'm like, I don't know if I've got what it takes. Like some days I think I do and some days I think I don't. And I know that that is something that would resonate with most of us in the room if we could be honest because life doesn't come at you in consistency, right? There are ups and there are downs. There are moments where we feel like we've got it together and then there are other moments where we struggle mightily. And some of us, even today, you may have walked in this room and you feel like, you know what, I'm not really sure that I've got what it takes, which makes Colossians a great word for some of us this morning. In Colossians chapter two, verse 10, Paul encourages us, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. I mean, that may be the key verse in the whole book. You've been brought to fullness. In other words, you have exactly what you need if you're in a relationship with Jesus to live the life that God has called you to live. That's the core message of Colossians. In fact, if you look at Colossians or Galatians or um, Ephesians, all they are are the practical applications of the teachings of Jesus for the local church. And so every idea that we discuss, they're actually Jesus ideas contextualized um, fit it in to the reality that you and I deal with as believers as we operate inside the local church. And so in Colossians, this idea that you have exactly what it takes was being challenged in their day just like it is in our day. And there were two main philosophies that were tripping up this church that Paul is writing to. 
And um, Paul refers to them as false teachings. A false teaching is something that just simply takes your eyes off Jesus and tries to place it on something else. And so we see this in the first two chapters. The first one is this idea of mysticism. Mysticism says that the world is boring. And because the world is boring, you gotta pursue an experience that will help you escape that boring world. <clears throat> the second false teaching is legalism. It's the idea that the world is not boring, it's actually bad. And in order to insulate yourself from a bad world, you gotta create all of these rules to kind of protect yourself from that. And so our author, Paul, he was a guy who had built his entire life on following the rules. He kept the rules. In fact, he spent every day of his life up until he met Jesus, making sure that everybody else kept the rules. But then he finally realized one day, I cannot keep all of these rules. Like, it is absolutely exhausting. In fact, the older I get, the worse I am at actually keeping my own laws. I don't have what it takes. And so what he's telling us in chapter three is that there is something that is beyond escaping the world. There is something that is beyond creating rules to protect yourself from the world, that it is possible for you and I to actually engage the world because we have what it takes to do what God is asking us to do. And Paul gives us three simple reminders to show us what it looks like to live into the idea that we have what it takes. And the first one is massive. It's just simply remember your identity. Remember your identity. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in this situation, but over the past couple of years, I've had to look into the idea of identity theft for various reasons. Um, millions of people every single day get their identity stolen. It's billions of dollars in loss every single year. That's why you have to change the password on your computer about every three days. Um, and I'm constantly getting notifications, right? Because these fools are nonstop trying to steal our identities. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it's not, it's not fun. It just drives me crazy. So you get these notifications, right? Enter your mother's maiden name. Um, give the name of your first pet. Name the place where you went on your first date. Give us your thumbprint. Give us a facial scan. Take a retinal ID. What are they actually asking? They're asking, who are you? Are you actually who you say you are? One of the things I love about the Bible is it always meets us exactly where we are. It doesn't just tell us who we are, it tells us whose we are. And that's what we see in the first couple of verses of chapter three. It gives us our identity. Check this out. Paul says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Now remember, he's writing to a group of Christians. He already knows what's happened to them. And so saying if is like a gr um, grammatical ploy to engage his readers. What he's saying is you already know what's happened to you. <clears throat> you know you've been raised with Christ. In other words, since you have been raised with Christ and since you are a new creation and since you were once dead, but now you're alive again, see that's important. Christianity doesn't make good people better it makes dead people come alive again. Jesus is not our life coach. Jesus is actually our savior. If, since, we have been raised with Christ, before you had to prove to everybody who you are, but now that you're in a relationship with Jesus, Jesus proves to everybody whose you are. Paul says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Seek things from above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now don't miss what he's saying there, because this right here, y'all, it is huge. This means that when God looks at you, and when God looks at me, he does not see us, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see your life because your life is hidden in Christ. And let that play out for a second. I mean, when you really think about it, aren't you glad that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin? 
that when God gazes upon you, he doesn't see your weakness or your struggle. It's not about your mistakes. It's not all the misspoken words that you give anything if you could take them back again. It's not the darkness of the thoughts that run through our heads from time to time. He doesn't see any of that. Paul's saying he sees his son. And when God sees his son, he's pleased. And if that's the case, that means you are not a sinful son or daughter you are a son or daughter who occasionally sins. And y'all, there is a massive difference. To put it another way, God does not look at us based on our history. God looks at us based on our destiny. In verse four, it says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. In other words, one day, we're all gonna be freed from our sin. And it's almost as if supernaturally, God is saying, for me, when I look at you, that day is now. I'm seeing you as sinless. That's awesome news, if you're a sinner. Are there any sinners in the house? Yeah. So what Paul is saying is, messy life, completely hidden. Broken life, completely hidden. Full of doubts, completely hidden. Racked with fear every single day, completely hidden. See, God is not basing his relationship with us on our sin and our struggle. It is based solely on the perfect work that Jesus has done on your behalf and my behalf. And I know what you may be thinking. Well, Stephen, I get it, man. That's awesome. Like, I'm, I came to church because I needed to hear that right there. But how do I live that out? See, that's the struggle, right? I mean, it's one thing to grasp information. Like, anybody can do that. But it doesn't matter how much information you have if you can't actually apply it to your daily life. And so Paul gives us advice on this. Check out those verses again. <clears throat> Since then you have been raised with Christ, seek things from above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. It's two words, seek and set. Or to say it another way, pursue and focus. That's how we live into the reality of whose we are. It's, it's the grind every single day of, of reminding ourselves, I don't belong to this world. I don't belong to this place. I have a higher calling on my life. My citizenship is actually in heaven. I don't have to live in this sort of stinking thinking that goes on in my life where I'm constantly condemning myself. I can rise above that. I can, I can see that God sees Jesus in me. I mean, that's the game changer. It's that, it's that constant reminder that we tell ourselves, look, I'm somebody. And I don't care what anybody else around, around me says about me. I don't care what goes on in my life. I'm gonna face the circumstances. I'm gonna face every relationship in the confidence that I am a son or daughter of the king. And even though the enemy may raise the voice in the back of my mind telling me that I'm unworthy or I've messed up too much or that sin was too great, I'm gonna, through God's grace, push through that. I'm gonna seek and I'm gonna set. So you gotta pursue and you gotta focus. Now, you may be thinking, man, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> well, it is. But please don't worry about all the work if you wanna keep struggling with self-condemnation. You don't even have to do it. Don't worry about putting in the work if you wanna keep struggling with insecurity or, or feeling defeated all the time or, or kind of marching through your life like you're Eeyore. Nobody sets out to be Eeyore, right? We talk about this all the time. Everybody grows up wanting to be Tigger, but we find ourselves, is that, is that landing anywhere with, with Eeyore? <laughs> but if you want a reality where every day you can be reminded that, you know what, I am a child of God, and I do have what it takes, you gotta put in the work. <laughs> See, you're never gonna drift into the life that God has for you. We gotta live into our true identity. And when I do, that ultimately helps me relate to my spouse because I don't relate to her for her acceptance, I relate to her from my acceptance. When I parent my kids, 
<coughs> it's not for their acceptance, but from acceptance. When I go and I do my job every day, it's not for somebody's acceptance, it's from an attitude of acceptance. And see, friends, I think that when we stop trying to perform for God, that's the moment that God can begin to do a work in and through our lives and can really do some pretty amazing things. Paul continues in verse five. This is where it gets fun. (laughs) Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other. Since you've taken off the old self with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Did I miss anybody's sin? I mean, that's that's a pretty exhaustive list right there, isn't it? What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, when you know your identity, you understand that you are completely safe in the presence of God. And once you understand that you are completely safe in the presence of God, you can begin to deal with the shortcomings and the sin in your life. And when we begin to deal with the sin in our life, we start declaring that that sin is powerless over us. Yeah, we're gonna mess up because nobody can be perfect. It's just that we live with a posture that we're not gonna be held hostage by the sins that we actually commit. So much, I think, of the burden that we carry with us is because we are not convinced that God can forgive every sin. We will say, yeah, God can forgive that person's sin, but you don't know what I did. And there's that constant voice in the back of our mind reminding us, yeah, you're, you're the exception. And what's scary about that is sometimes we just end up going through the motions. We wake up every day and we put on this facade and we try to convince people that we've got our life together, right? It's so much easier, I think, to try to pretend that we're okay than to actually get ourselves in a position where through God's Holy Spirit, we've, we become okay. And for some of us, it's not just wishing it away or it's not just willing it away. For some of us, maybe we gotta spend some time in therapy. You don't hear that too often in the church, but I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> maybe we gotta plug into a ministry where we begin to deal with our addiction. Maybe, maybe we gotta have an honest conversation with somebody in our circle of influence that we can trust. That's why community is so important. It's not just so that you can stretch out your friend group, it's so that you can have other people who are pulling in the same direction you are. Because your life may be going okay right now, but you live long enough, and you're gonna face something that you gotta deal with. See, Paul is pointing to something very interesting. It's the idea that sin often wears a mask. In other words, there's a sin behind the sin. I don't know if you caught it, but in the middle of verse five, he lists all of these sins, and then he says this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, and then here it is, which is idolatry. So most of our sins, according to Paul, they're actually issues of idolatry. In fact, the most warned about sin in the scripture is not sexual sin, and it's not greed, it's not even pride, it's idolatry. Allowing the affections of our heart to be captivated by something other than God. And if we don't get to the root of it, if we only clip the fruit as we go along through life, it's gonna always grow back. I mean, think about what drives your life. How many people do you know if it's not you? that their whole life is oriented around getting the approval of somebody else. It is amazing what we can get ourselves into just simply because we're looking for somebody else's approval. Think about issues of acceptance. Think about all the issues of security that we all deal with. Think about that drive to be successful, that, that, that it's almost like a drug when people start patting you on the back. And then think about the areas where you're weak. I bet with some honest reflection, those things that drive your life and my life, if we match them up with our weaknesses, we're gonna see a pretty close link to what's driving our life. See, I think 
the degree to which you and I are able to deal with the underlying issues in our lives, the closer we get to experiencing true freedom. The question is, how do you make progress? Well, Tim Keller put it like this. When your heart relaxes its grip on anything else that it thinks that it needs other than God, that, that's when you start to make progress. When your heart relaxes. And your heart begins to say, you know what, I don't need that. I might want that, I might be tempted by that, but I don't need that, I have what it takes. That's how you know you're making progress when it comes to sin. See, it's our ability to own our own stuff that begins to loosen our heart's grip. And that's the key to living in healthy human relationships. Think about it, my ability to acknowledge my own brokenness, it's gonna affect every relationship that I come into. I know what my identity is, I know that I've got problems, therefore that's gonna directly influence how I relate to my spouse, it's gonna relate to how I parent my kids, how I approach my work, and every other relationship that I'm involved in. I live into my identity, and I learn to own my own sin and brokenness. And then Paul continues in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I like that imagery. Take off the old and put on the new. Sometimes you gotta take off the skinny jeans because you're too big to wear skinny jeans, right? <laughs> Sometimes, if you're like me, you gotta go with a shirt untucked because you tuck your shirt in, everybody's like, whoa, bro. <laughs> I like that imagery, right? Take something off, put on something new. Notice Paul says, clothe yourselves, bear with each other, get good at forgiveness. And what's he driving at? He's reminding us that so much of the pain in life is most often felt through the presence of people. And what Paul is saying is, I want you to get to a place where you can release your pain. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't life be awesome if it weren't for the people? <laughs> right? I mean, wouldn't it? What, it's like college would have been awesome if you didn't have to go to class. You can do that for one semester, right? You cannot avoid people. And because we're constantly dealing with other human beings, none of whom are perfect, and all of whom are broken and messy and self-focused and struggling with the same issues that we struggle with, it's in the context of relationships that most of us actually experience pain. And what Paul is saying is that in relationships you can get hurt, but in relationships you can also find healing. He's teaching us something really important, that when you and I approach someone else, our mindset, our attitude, it makes a massive difference. Paul's saying, don't approach human beings as if they're a mistake. Don't approach human beings looking for what you can get out of them because that's not a way to build your life. If you want true freedom, if you wanna see God move, when you interact with other human beings, whether they live in your house or you see them at lunch or you interact with them when you get to where you're going to serve, approach them with compassion. Put on a little kindness. Show some humility. Practice gentleness. Be patient with people. And above all else, Paul says, let love rule the day. Learn to see them for who they are, not what you can get out of them. And because love is the ultimate goal, Paul says you gotta learn to embrace forgiveness. That is critical to getting life right. So you live into your identity, you own your own part, and you wrap everything in love, and you do the best you can to practice forgiveness. You gotta let go of the grudge. You gotta get over being so angry all the time. You gotta get past someone else's flaws or inconsist inconsistencies. You gotta learn to just look at people, understanding that the cross wasn't just for you, it was for everybody. 
And they may think differently, they may look differently, they may live their life differently, they may not be following the same God you're following, but God still cares about them. So much, I think, of what causes brokenness in our world in this moment that you and I are in right now is I think everybody's desperate to know that they are loved. And we will go to whatever length we gotta go to to try to find that love. And it ends up expressing itself in some very unhealthy ways which is why Paul started off with identity. You gotta know exactly who you are. You gotta understand who created you and who you belong to. And once you cling to that and you seek and you remind yourself every day that this is who I am, then the things that happen in life, they may be tough and it may be frustrating and you may be tempted to be angry about it, but you just keep reminding yourself, I'm facing this thing. It's not punishment, maybe it's preparation. Maybe God's gonna use what's happening in my life because there's something else coming down the pike that I gotta be prepared for. And we just start leaning into the idea that, you know what, I'm gonna love everybody that's in my life to the best of my ability. And when when they mess up, I'm gonna offer forgiveness. And when I mess up, I'm gonna go back to them. I'm gonna try to work it out. I mean, think about the relationships you guys are in. Think about those of us that are just married. If you could approach every day of your marriage that way, if you could just decide, you know what? I'm a child of God and so is my spouse. And I got problems and so does my spouse. But I'm gonna work through those problems. I'm gonna own what's mine and I'm gonna practice forgiveness on a regular basis. That's how people make it. 50, 60, 70 years. It's not because they stopped talking to each other. It's not because they stopped doing what husbands and wives do. It's because they've leaned into their relationship and they understand whose they are. Think about the way you parent your kids. I mean, how many of our kids, life would be completely changed if we just said every once in a while, you know what, I messed up. It's hard for parents to do. But when we model that to our kids, they start to see that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fall flat on my face. It's okay to go through some stuff because I saw my mom and dad do it and they owned up to it. Think about how you would approach your job, how different that would be if you just walked in every day to whatever chaos you face and you just walked in and you go, you know what, I'm a son or daughter of the king and there is not one thing that's gonna happen to me today they can take that away from me. You just embrace your identity. You show some patience and you offer forgiveness. I mean, y'all, it could change the world. And I don't know what our world needs more now than anything, than a heavier dose of that. I think it would be a game changer. But Paul links it all back to this idea that if you're in a relationship with Christ, you have been raised with Christ. Your life is different, which is what makes communion so powerful. On his final night, the scriptures say that Jesus um, had his disciples in an upper room and he knew that his time was coming to an end and so they shared this meal, right? And when the meal was over, Jesus took a loaf of bread. I don't know if it was as massive as this loaf of bread. Um, This is a big loaf of bread, y'all. And he broke it. And he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, here, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. And then he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, here, take and drink. This is my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then there's that line that gets attached to Jesus later on in the scriptures where he said, do this in remembrance of me. If you're struggling with your identity today, communion's for you. It's that reminder through some bread and some juice that you are somebody regardless of what voices are speaking into your life. If you're struggling with dealing with what's going on inside of you, communion is for you. Because it's that reminder that none of us are worthy and yet all of us have God's grace available and, and whatever it is that you've been struggling with, it got nailed to the cross with Jesus. Or maybe you've been wrestling with issues of forgiveness. There's just so much pressure that it's, it's dominating your life. Communion is for you, it's a reminder that it's gonna be okay. Ultimately, it will be okay. 
I don't know how it's gonna work out. I don't know how long it's gonna take. But whatever it is that you're wrestling with, ultimately God gets the victory. And we know that because Jesus stepped out of the tomb and came back to life. And it's a reminder that if Jesus can overcome death, that anything is possible. We just have to have hope. And so today, I've got some friends who are gonna come help us receive communion. If you're watching online, I hope you got some stuff you can take it with us. The thing I love about this is it does not belong to yours truly. It does not belong to Cokesbury Church. It's not a Methodist thing. Everybody's invited to take communion because it belongs to God. And so today, you just simply need to have professed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can come to God's table and you can find exactly what you need. So I'm gonna ask my friends if they will to come on up and we've got plenty of stations. I'm gonna be right down front. If you need gluten-free, you're gonna come to me. Um, you can just kind of work your way out and uh, these guys will be ready in just a second. And if you wanna take a moment to pray, you can do that. If you wanna just maybe pass by, we like to write on the walls around this place. And we've got some names of people that have been written up over this year that I don't know what's going on in their life, but somebody cares enough about them to write their name on the wall. So maybe you just wanna, wanna put your hand up there and pray over somebody. Or maybe you just wanna kinda go back to your seat and soak up this last song. I don't know what you need, but I know you can find it here. So you come now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.